Did you know subplots can make or break your narrative? And this goes for subplots that are expanded across series and sagas. That's why today we are going to talk about mapping out subplots and character arcs in a novel or series. Okay? Now, you have to think to yourself, are you are you ready? Are you ready to dive into the art of storytelling and learn how to enrich your series or saga with captivating subplots and dynamic character arcs? You know, um, well, this series, this video itself in this series is going to explore how to bring layers and de depth to your narrative. Uh, so, you know, let's do it. Why, why is that important, though? I know you asked, Tom, why, why is that important? Well, understanding how to effectively integrate subplots and character arcs is a crucial element. We say that often on this channel, crucial. All right, element in adding depth and complexity to your series or saga. These elements enrich the main plot, enhance character development, and engage readers by providing multiple layers to your narrative. They ensure that your story remains compelling and dynamic across multiple books, offering varied perspectives and emotional journeys that resonate with your audience. And ultimately, what I'm saying there is a subplot doesn't necessarily have to be uh, molded into the main plot as if they were almost the same thing. They can be. They could go side by side. They could kind of cross each other. The point is that they elevate and enhance the main plot. They add. It's like looking at a... Um, you know, uh, 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 you know, your dinner table, right? And you see a turkey on the center of the table and some plates. But then you see turkey with some uh, yams, ooh, mashed uh, mashed potatoes or yams, right? Or and then you see peas. Or even if you look at your plate, you know, you just put a, some uh, turkey on there. Eh, but then you add some peas and then some carrots and then maybe some mashed potatoes and then maybe some. Uh, uh, whatever, right? The more you add to it, the more appealing it is. The more it fills you up, right? The uh, uh metaphorically, emotionally, in this situation, uh, you know what I'm saying. So that's the point of a subplot: is to dress up the plate, uh, not to take away from the turkey that we put on there, which is the main course. Okay, right? On Thanksgiving, it's the main course. Um. But to add some uh, variation, variety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's talk about really what this this video is going to explore. And in doing so, you know, placing subplots and character arcs, you know, that is an art form all itself. May I add? Here, let me adjust this camera for you. Don't get too nervous. It's not an earthquake. All right. If you've seen my other videos, you know that I don't put a lot of thought or um, or more important, I don't put a lot of thought into uh, character creation. I'm not one of those list people. Uh, however, there is nothing wrong with being a list person. There's nothing wrong going their favorite color is purple. Uh, they like this. They like that. I enjoy developing the characters on multiple levels. The first level is usually... Uh, I like to start with a generalized journey, and then I go deeper and deeper and deeper as I discover the characters on the page, even though I am a heavy outliner. And that's part of the characters. I, I do a little bit of work on what I'm looking for, uh, but I try not to exhaust my resources before I start working on the story, because I want the characters to... Uh, have an ebb and flow with the narrative. I want the narrative to kind of nurture the characters and the characters to nurture the narrative. Their choices start moving the narrative, but the narrative itself starts moving the characters. It's sort of like they have to work in tandem, uh, but they start developing these personalities. So to break that down, I have a general idea of what I want to explore between relationships, characters, and emotional journeys. Just a very general, what am I looking for? Then I let the plotting get worked out. And in that plotting, I discover the characters' voices. With that said, I'm going to touch on a general concept of what I want from my characters. Then I focus on the subplots first and get those placed into the outline. And finally, I'll show you how I discover the character arcs. 
Now, the purpose of splitting up the process like that is why I don't handle the main plot and subplots together. If you watched the first video, we tackled the main plot and didn't really focus on subplots or other characters. We were just like, what needs to happen for this book to exist, right? This narrative. Uh, but, you know, again, the purpose, uh, the, re the reason uh, I don't like to handle the main plot uh, and the subplots together is because I don't want to... Um, mess up the main plot. I don't want to diverge. I don't want to get too into the secondary stories. And the purpose of splitting up the process like that is why, uh, like I said, I don't ultimately work on them together. So now, once I do have the main plot done, I can see what ideas will work with the main plot characters and what other elements can be explored in a way that does uh, diverge the story, but not too far and not and not in a way that overwhelms uh, the main plot. Because, again, you don't want to put something on the turkey plate. Like, you're not going to put, uh, you know, a birthday cake on that turkey plate because you don't want the turkey now. I want that cake. For example, I don't want to tell a romantic comedy, and in the background, one of the characters is a serial killer. However, if that story intrigued me, like if I was like a serial killer in the background, uh, then I may change the way I approach the narrative. It is no longer a romantic comedy because that has rules. It is more of a comedic thriller. And that's okay too, by the way. You can mix genres. Uh, it's just in a romantic comedy, they uh, they end up together because of the romance. Um, but the serial killer can't overpower. If the serial killer does overpower that romantic story, just change, pivot. And if it's really the story you want to tell, start looking at it differently. Um, I mean, that's how we uh, grow as writers and how we change the industry is by trying things, even if it fails. Failure, as I say, fail to succeed, right? Okay. So um, now before we get into the bulk of the lesson, if uh, you've not done so already, I would recommend that you go watch the first video, uh, which is known as uh, the main plot, like mapping out the main plot. Um, if you've watched that video, let's talk about some tips and tricks before we get into the know-how of it. Now, these tips and tricks will help you in the process of looking at subplots and what the, the breakdown method is. So the number one thing, uh, well, not number, these are not uh, numbered in value. They are just, this is the first tip. It just so happens. Uh, general character concept and color coding. Oh, yeah. I love this part. Uh, see, you want to take a character framework and not just, I need a tough woman or man here, but think about a journey before placing any bias elements on it. I say bias uh, because, again, for example, if you meet somebody and they say they are Christian or Jewish or whatever, it doesn't matter. Let's say they, they say they're the religious of blah, right? Everything you know about blah is pasted on them. So that happens to us as writers, too. Uh, if we focus on the outside first and then go in deeper, we might not find true elements to that character. We might start trying to mold those elements to fit the outside exterior. Uh, so I personally like to wonder and focus on the journey, the emotional journey or through line, and then slowly build up from there, which I'm going to explain now in my notes. So the face value details can be added later. Since the stuff that truly makes a character strong is their emotional journey, presenting conflict that can be challenged, lead uh, to consequences, good or bad, and ultimately change their position slightly, completely, or not at all until finally they have grown by the end of the novel. Think about the main com concept of your interest, such as the character discovers their inner passion for skydiving and through their training ends up learning about a corrupt group of business people who use skydiving training schools that mule out industry secrets, money, and other exchanges. Now, this part of it should be focused on the concept itself with one, two, or three sentences to figure out what the idea is. Now, if you notice... I focused on the journey. The character discovers their inner passion for skydiving and through their training ends up learning about a concept group, uh, a, a corrupt group of business people who use skydiving training schools that mule 
about industry secrets, money, and other exchanges. Now, if you, I didn't, we don't know if they're a guy. We don't know if they're a girl. We don't know whatever. We we don't know anything beyond the emotional journey. And then now we can kind of paint over it. And whatever you paint it, whatever you paint on the outside has that really strong foundation. They have to go through that journey uh, emotionally and, you know, what they look like and how they act. That's all secondary at that point. And that's what makes the dressing appealing now. All right. And number two. Connecting character concepts into plot points. Now, what you do is you take that general idea and you place it into the outline. When doing so, you want them to fit within the 27 plot point outline thematically. For example, using the above concept, you might not have the character learn about the corrupt group stuff in plot point one, the ordinary world. The, this, okay? Before the disruption of the introduction. However, you could place it in the second plot point, the inciting incident, or maybe one of the twists or pinch plot points, like plot point eight, the first plot twist or pinch happens, or plot point 20, another plot twist pinch, the protagonist experiences a completely unexpected event, making all things worse. Or you could even look at plot point 21, uh, plot twist that leads to the darkest moment. Now, what I, what I would say is go one by one when placing the narrative threads of the subplot. Additionally, know that you can do, uh, know that you do not have to place a narrative thread within each plot point. Just make sure it fits within the plot point itself. All right. So a couple things before I go to uh, the third tip. So we generalize the journey. We said the character discovers they're in a passion for uh, skydiving and through their training ends up. So if that's a subplot for that character, we could look at it in beats. The character discovers they're in a passion for skydiving. So that might be an inciting incident for that particular character. We set them up in the ordinary world, so we know that we're going to get the first and second plot points with this subplot because you want to set it up. You want to just be like, they discovered, right? So now we know we have to go back enough where it makes sense, and the furthest we could go back is the first plot point. So you say plot point one, the ordinary world, uh, they don't have a passion <laughs> for skydiving, but they're looking for some passion. So you set up their motivations. They, they are looking for something that, uh, drives them where they're like, you know, I'm not passionate about anything. And then they discover skydiving and they're like, this is amazing. And that becomes the inciting incident. Then we might not really explore a lot of that in plot point three, four, five, six, and so forth. But we might hit plot point eight and realize that they're, we're seeding that something doesn't seem right uh, with the skydiving school. Uh, something seems a little off. We don't have to necessarily say that it's a corrupt group of business people who use skydiving training schools that mule out industry secrets, money, and other exchanges. We could just start seeding that, and that becomes the pinch or the twist. Um, it doesn't necessarily take away from the main plot, but maybe, maybe, maybe uh, the character who is... Uh, running the, the school or is one of the people behind the scenes away from this school is involved in this process in the main plot. But anyway, so that's how you would look at it. You would just see, well, where can I grow and, and uh, influence this subplot? And you kind of fit that in. I'm going to show you with real time examples, by the way, once we get into the walkthrough. All right, let's jump on uh, the third thing real quick. I would suggest map out one character at a time. You don't have to. Like, obviously, you in the brainstorming stage, you could just kind of come up whatever you want. But over time, when you start focusing, always focus on one element so you can make sense of it the most. And then as you add, you can adjust, right? So uh, a helpful approach that has led me to a more streamlined result is handling each subplot through a character. I try to keep it to one character and map out all their plot points. This allows me to see the plot points coming together where I can adjust or mix them up into other areas of the story. As I continue to grow my character lists, you learn a few things. A, maybe you have too many characters within too many subplots. B, some of the subplots are overshadowing the main plot. And C, 
you can see where the where and when too many subplots are stuck together. Before I go any further, that is true. You can realize that too many subplots are in one plot point. Now, if you're writing epic fantasy or the genre you write in dictates sort of a little bit more cluster, that's okay. But again, if you're writing a romance or uh, in the in the example we're using for this series of videos, the noir, uh, you don't want too many subplots. You want to kind of keep it streamlined as best as possible because the important part is the main plot and the uh, uncovering of, of the, the, the case. Um, but ultimately, your subplots don't have to be massive moments, even if you general if you use general summary of the subplot itself. For example, uh, using the skydiving passion in uh, the uh, in plot point two, the inciting incident, if you're working in a chapter, one of the characters could say, oh, yeah, a buddy of mine asked me to go skydive. And I, I, it seems a little too dangerous for me, but, you know, I, I, I ditched on the last three times to do something else. So I figured I owe them. And then the main character would be like, eh, you're crazy, but uh, all right, good luck, you know. And And then that's it. And then maybe like three or four chapters later, they're like, Oh, you're still skydiving? And like, oh, it's the best. And now it didn't take up a lot, but you did get in your subplot. Because again, the subplot shouldn't really overwhelm the main plot. Uh, and sometimes that just means like, are you adding, are you giving subplots like chapter upon chapter upon chapter upon chapter? Now, now you might be doing too much. All right. Uh, the, the key to strong subplotting is seeding. We've talked about seeding uh, often on this channel. I have a video dedicated to uh, the terminology of seeding and how it works and what it is. Um, but seeding something from a subplot can be as simple as a response to information from the character, a word, a line spoken, even a small detail like, and my buddy uh, asked me if I want to go skydiving. I think it's crazy, but I, I bailed on him last three times when we were supposed to go do other stuff, so I owe it to him. Very simple. Remember, not all moments of subplots need to be a chapter's length, though they can be. All right. Before we get into the walkthrough, if you like what you've been listening to and you enjoy the videos, but you haven't done so yet already, please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. All right, let's get right to it. Brainstorming. Brainstorming? No, that's not it. Do, 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 do. Okay. Ba, 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 ba. All right. ba, da, da. Get out of here. Get out of here. Boom. All right. Sorry. Summarizing a character's narrative journey. <laughs> Look, I'm there. All right. And you can think. So this is the redemption of a fallen cop. Uh, I'm I'm doing a, a, a very simple version of it. Um. Before I get into a quick deep dive of the walkthrough, I will say this. I will I will write down every main character. Remember, a main character doesn't have to be the protagonist. They're just the uh, designated characters to the story. And then I, I will create sub characters, you know, the, the, uh, the secondary characters. And I will create arcs for all of them. I, I will just think of what are their stories. Um, Especially at this part, this stage, because I know that I'm going to be expanding them over a series or a saga, mostly because I'm writing epic fantasy. Uh, <clears throat> but when when you're dealing with something a little bit more simplified, like a, no, uh, a noir or a romance or something like that, you you can just stick to like a more like general thought, like the redemption of a fallen cop. I know that this cop's name is going to be Tom. <laughs> um, uh uh, no, I just, I just picked the name. Um, so the fall, the redemption of the fallen cop is, is the plot, the subplot thread line. So, right. Uh, and I, and I created one, two, three, four, five, six. I created six beats to that subplot. All right. <clears throat> However, if I like on my epic fantasy, I might write something, the redemption of a fallen cop, and then maybe Tom has a secondary subplot. Maybe it's, uh, you know, um, the sis the sister and uh, the siblings, the sibyl, the sibyl rivalry, and it's about Tom and his sister, and they have a rivalry going on. And you know what? 
Uh, in this, he used to be a cop, and she's still a cop. So the rivalry is that she's still a successful cop, and he's not a cop. And that's like a secondary subplot. And then I might be like, I really like this Tom character. Let me give him a third subplot, right? And that third subplot I might call, you know, uh, Revenge of the Mom, you know? And, uh, and what it is is the mom still supports Tom, even though Tom is just a security guy, as you'll learn. All right, and... Uh, she's uh she's upset at her daughter because uh she's always teasing tom and that's a third a third subplot right but just for simplicity i only created uh uh three subplots um each subplot is only one new character or one new idea um i didn't want to get too crazy into it just i want to i want to just make this easy so uh, what I like to do is I like to create a summary for each of the beats. Uh, I might even create a summary for the plot, the, the, the theme. So the redemption of a fallen cop. And I might write that, uh, like this, I might take this and summarize it, you know? So before I even expand, cause I did a lot of the work before we did the video, cause I like to do the work in real time on the live videos. Um, but anyway, so, uh, you know, the subplot, if we just look at it while investigating the CD bars, uh, basically, um, the main character ends up uh, meeting Tom, who's a former cop. He's dismissed for force for corrupt charges. Anyway, so he has a redemption arc. Right. And uh, so then there's another beat where, uh, you know, Tom helps to navigate the dangerous landscape. And then there's another beat. He reveals his side of the story. And then there's another beat where. Tom comes to, to the aid of Jack, the main character, um, and Tom's actions not only save Jack, but also provide crucial assistance. Uh, in the final confrontation at the rain soaked, Tom plays a pivotal role in outmaneuver. I'm going to get deeper into this, but I'm just kind of like, and then finally, I'm just saying uh, Tom's path to redemption, right? So he reflects not only on their journey, but also on Tom's path to redemption. In a brief exchange outside the bar, Jack acknowledges Tom's redemption. So the summary of that might be um, Tom is a character who uh, runs a uh, security uh, security uh, company uh, who was, um, uh, you know, let go uh, as a cop for corrupt reasons. Uh, and over the journey, he's trying to prove his worth to his friend Jack and uh, ultimately does um, by being pivotal in the exploration of Jack's case. And that's a quick summary. But then you want to break that down into beats. Like I said, you want to <laughs> beat it out and get it going. So that brings us to our... So that's what you do. is You, you could either summarize just what the subplot is, right, for the first step. And then you want to figure out how do you... What are the summaries of those beats? Like how many of those beats do I need? It could be one... Literally, it could be a subplot could happen and it could appear and go in like two seconds. It could, you know, it could be a chapter long. It can be. It's, it's your story. Um, I decided to let it be the length of the narrative. Uh, so I broke it up into six beats that I can move throughout the narrative itself. All right. Which brings us to the first subplot. The redemption of a fallen cop. Now, this subplot adds layers to the main narrative, offering parallels and themes of redemption and moral ambiguity. Ambiguity. Oh, my God. Dyslexia. Ambiguity. Ambiguity. By the way, that's the crazy thing about the brain. Ambiguity 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 specific was the a very difficult word for me and i had to keep saying specific specific like i had to break it up into three different words right i had to use the syllables uh but ambiguity 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 <sighs> dyslexia just all right it provides additional okay let me reread that this first subplot uh, adds layers to the main narrative, offering parallels and themes of redemption and moral ambiguity. It provides additional conflict and resolution, enriching the story's texture and emotional depth. So if we look at this, uh, I already know where I'm going to place it, but uh, for, for, uh, for fun's sakes, 
Um, while investigating the seedy bars for clues about Elizabeth's blackmailer, Jack runs into an old acquaintance, Tom, a former cop who was dismissed from the force due to corrupt charges. Tom, now a private security consultant, hints at his desire for redemption and his knowledge of the city's underworld, which could be useful to Jack. All right. Now, the second beat to that that subplot is after Jack becomes a target for the underworld, he reluctantly, reluctantly seeks Tom's help to navigate the dangerous landscapes. OK, Tom's insight. Uh, lead Jack to a crucial piece of evidence. Okay. Uh, but Jack remember remains uh, wary of Tom's true motivations. Okay. All right. The third beat uh, actually happens in Act 2. As Jack reflects on his past and the case's personal consequences, Tom reveals his side of the story, expressing remorse for his past actions and his wish to make amends. Tom's vulnerability and his insights into the corrupt businessman Michael provide Jack with a different perspective highlighting the themes of redemption and the blurry line between right and wrong all right the fourth subplot beat is after Jack is I'm not going to do this for all the subplots but uh after Jack is betrayed and wounded Tom comes to his aid risking his own safety Tom's actions now only save Jack, but also provide crucial assistance in uncovering Elizabeth's true role in the conspiracy. This act of bravery and loyalty earns Tom a measure of redemption in Jack's eyes. Hey, two. The kitty cat's here. Now, the uh, the fifth beat happens in Act 3. I'm not going to tell you what plot point yet, even though you probably figured it out. In the final confrontation of the rain-soaked pier, Tom plays a pivotal role in outmaneuvering maneuvering Michael, using his knowledge of the criminal underworld to Jack's advantage. His contribution is instrumental in the downfall of the villains. Right. <clears throat> and the sixth and final one happens in the epilogue. As Jack watches Elizabeth sing in the jazz bar, he reflects not only on their journey, but also on Tom's path to redemption. In a brief exchange outside the bar, Jack acknowledges Tom's redemption, suggesting a possible collaboration in the future, tying up, tying up the subplot with a hopeful note on second chances and new beginnings. So if you look at this, the first two are in Act 1, the second two are in Act 2, uh the fifth beat is in act three and then finally we conclude we we give a little like re resolution to it in the uh epilogue. hey kitty all right so come on up here come on <sighs> sorry i'm an animal person uh you know what i'm not sorry uh, <laughs> okay now if we were to look at that I want to put that into the story, right? Okay. So, again, if you've seen the first video, boop, you know what's about to go down. We're going to go, and I look at this, and I see, I see the first six plot points, and I think to myself, does, does it feel right, uh, if my first beat is well investigating, well, that means the ordinary world might not work. Okay. So I have to say it can't be the inciting incident because while investigating, while investigating, that means that the inciting incident has already happened. Okay. Price is right, everyone. Uh, the third one is the reaction to the inciting incident, which if we look at the screen, as Jack delves into the case, he uncovers layers uh, of deceit, drawing him deeper into this. So um, it could go here. It could go there. But I want to go on reacts to uh, to the plot point four. The protagonist reacts to and reflects on the long term impacts. And this is because Jack's investigation leads into a CD bar uh, to CD bars and back alleys where he encounters thugs and informants with cryptic messages 
indicating a larger conspiracy theory. So we're going to put it here. While investigating the CD bars for clues about Elizabeth's blackmail, Jack runs into an old... So we know that based on my beat, it'll work out because he's already in the bars. I don't have to create an extra scene. Tom can now be in one of the bars. And uh, we meet him. Okay. Let's go back up. So let's go to the second one. Oh, now we can... Uh, this one's done. All right. So after Jack becomes a target for the underworld. All right. So let's go back down. We're on four, five. Despite uh, the protagonist decides to take action. Does this make sense? Despite warning to drop the case, Jack's sense of duty compels him to protect Elizabeth. Ooh, that doesn't sound like it would fit there. Uh, the immediate consequences of the action taken by the protagonist. Well, Jack's interference angers the city's underworld, making him a target. His office is ransacked. Dang you, ransacked, I say. And this is where I would like to put that. So after Jack becomes a target, because the, 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 he has to become the target of the underworld, he reluctantly seeks Tom's help to navigate the dangerous landscape. You see how that's working? Let's go to Thrace. And we know this is done. We're almost done. We're almost done. All right. Let's get into Act 2. All right. So all this is, uh, you know, there's only three more plot points after that moment. And we're going to kind of let Jack do his thing before I bring Tom back in. Give a little breather to that. Sub sub all right. So in Act 2, you introduce the protagonist to the new world, which would be the plot point 10. And uh, I don't think that fits. I don't think that fits with uh, ja as Jack reflects on his past. He's reflecting on his past. Which would be old juxtaposition, which brings us to plot point 12. Boom. So let's just bring him in there as Jack reflects on his past. And the case's personal consequences, Tom reveals his side of the story. Ooh, that has the essence of an old juxtaposition as well, because you're reflecting on two different points in life. All right, let's go. We're almost there. We're almost there. Boom. All right. This one is the fourth beat, okay? So after the just a position, okay, uh, we get to... Um, now we're in the midpoint... What is this? Oh. Now we're in the uh, crisis of new world, which is ultimately going to lead to the conflict. And uh, we know that Jack is betrayed. Look at that. He's betrayed. And... Uh, the Tom subplot is uh, after Jack is betrayed. So we know that he has to be betrayed first, which means we're going to put it here in 15. Boop. As you can see, I'm going to take me off so you can see a little better. Okay. Boop. And I'm going to remove this. All right. So there you go. After Jack is betrayed and wounded, Tom comes to his aid. What a nice guy, you know? I like this Tom guy. I think he's going to be redeemed. All right. Boo, 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 boo. And here is the fifth. In the final confrontation at the rain-soaked pier. So let's get down there. We're in Act 3 now. Okay. Converge. Power within leading to the final battle. We're going to just throw it there because the final confrontation unfolds at a rain-soaked pier. So we know that in the final confrontation at the rain-soaked pier, I need to get that beat in that moment. It makes the most sense. But I've already said uh, that the last beat is in the epilogue. The epilogue. And that takes us to here. All right. Now, I'm not going to go uh, I'm not going to go deep into like I just did with the first uh, subplot, but I am going to show you I'm going to let you see the second and third subplots and I'll read why those are helpful. So here's the second subplot. OK, and I'll take that down there. You can uh, you could obviously pause, pause the screen and read the subplot just so you understand it. I will quickly place them into the narrative so you can see that okay but this subplot known as the mysterious informant right this subplot not only adds an additional layer of intrigue with the mysterious informant but also 
broadens the scope of the narrative to include themes of media in integrity, 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 and the fight against systematic corruption. Okay. Complementing the main story's focus on personal redemption and the battle against individual criminal elements. So let's do this real quick. All right. I'm going to take this and I'm going to put this in act one plot point three, which goes right here. And this is because as Jack develops and deeper into the blackmail case, right? So we know that he's going in and that's the first thing. That's the reaction to the inciting incident because Jack is on the case. Okay. Then we go up here. This is actually going to go into plot into act two. We're going to jump right to act two with the second beat. All right. This is going to be plot point 10. All right. Which is we're going to introduce the audience and the protagonist to the new world. So as he's investigating the corruption of the heart of the city, Shadow continues to provide valuable le uh, leads. However, Jack notices a pattern. The tips often place him in risky situations. Oh, that son of a... All right. This will also be an act two. Let's do it. Eh. We're going to put it in plot point 14, okay, which is the midpoint conflict. All right, so after Jack is betrayed by a trust informant, he confronts Shadow through a cryptic message demanding a meeting, and the Shadow agrees. Ooh. Uh, the shadow is revealed to be Anna, a journalistic, a journalist who has been investigating Michael's criminal activities. Oh, yes. Excellent. All right. This fourth one, we're going to we're going to now jump into the third act. Let's jump into the third act. Plot point 18. Let's do it. Do, do, do. Which is uh, despite the setback, the protagonist will succeed, and that's because despite the rocky start of their relationship, uh, Jack and Anna start working together more closely, combining their skills to gather evidence against Michael. Oh, that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right. And at the, what's this? The fifth one, two, three, four, five. Yep. Boom. Look at that. Look at that. We're gonna go to plot point twenty-six which is right before the very end. So we know Anna is helping with the final, they will fail or succeed moment. So in the climax, as Michael is taken into custody, Anna captures the moment with her camera. Woo! Ensuring that the story will make headlines. And of course, we give her a moment in the epilogue. But how do we do that so we don't take up space? Well, in the epilogue, Jack just reads Anna's article in the jazz bar. Nice. All right. So let's look at subplot three. Again, you can pause it and read that so you know what the old friend in depth. All right. This subplot enriches the narrative by exploring the personal sacrifices made by those caught in the crossfire of Jack's world. It underscores the themes of loyalty, friendship, and the human cost of of navigating a world rife with corruption, adding emotional layers to the noir tapestry of the story. This one also has six. And as you can see, the first two are in, uh, the first one is uh, act one. The second two are in act two. Uh, then uh, four and five is act three. And then we have an epilogue. So let's do this. Act one, plot point five. Where is it? Where is it? Boom. Boom. No. Plot point five right there. So this is the protagonist decides to take action. And since they're investigating, they go to they go to Charlie because Charlie owns a bar that serves as a neutral ground in the city's underworld. I like it. I like it. I like it. Now we're going to go to act two. Plot point 11. Here we go. Protagonists can take a break. So this is the uh, the fun part. This is where we get to learn a little bit about the characters. They don't necessarily have to be taking a break, but this is where we would get a little bit more insight to the characters. It's always fun. So Jack Finkert and visits to Charlie's bar for information, start to draw unwanted attention, putting Charlie's business and safety at risk. Despite this, Charlie continues to aid Jack driven by a sense of loyalty. Their interactions reveal a deep-seated camaraderie, uh, com camaraderie 
highlighting Jack's ability to inspire loyalty. So this is the fun and games part that really comes out. Okay. Where are we? All right. We're going to go to act two plot point 13. And the reason we do that is because this is the buildup to the midpoint conflict. Now, if you notice just real quick, this is the midpoint conflict. All right. Uh, it's the build up. The it's the build up. Then it's the actual midpoint conflict. Okay, and then it's the uh, the consequences of that. And I gave each one, each plot point, its own subplot, just so we don't overwhelm the importance of the midpoint. And in this case, the situation escalates when thugs set uh, by Michael sent by Michael vandalize Charlie's bar as a warning to Jack. Feeling responsible for the harm that has come to his friend, Jack offers to cut ties to protect Charlie. However, Charlie refuses, insisting on seeing the fight through to the end, emphasizing the theme of loyalty over self-preservation. All right. And then uh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Now we're going to give this a little something some. Let's go to Act 3, Plot Point 17. Protagonist decides to take some action, so Charlie uses his underworld contacts to provide Jack with a safe haven after dangerous encounter. Ooh, demonstrating his unwavering support. I like it. I like it. And then, of course, number five. We will have to go to Act 3 again. Plot point 25. All right. Boom. Okay. Also, again, if you notice, uh, in these three plot points, right, which would be the protagonist fights and wins... I don't overwhelm it. I let I let Jack have his moment in plot point 27. There are no other subplots. We just sort of like let the story kind of resolve. Um, uh, and uh, I only give uh, two of the plot points uh, subplots. So that's important. Same thing here. I only give one. See, like you don't have to have subplots everywhere. In uh, section seven, victory seems impossible. There are no subplots in... Uh, any of the three plot points that live there, right? Okay, there's only two here. I gave three here because it's uh, you know the midpoint conflict. This I only gave. Uh, let's see, I gave one to each. This one doesn't have any. Here's another section three. There are zero subplots in here, so you don't have to give subplots everywhere. But let's finish the last one. This is also the epilogue. We okay. In the jazz bars, a subdued ambience, Jack receives a postcard from Charlie. Now, now, if you notice, again, remember I was saying subplots can be like a quick, a quick moment or a quick a line or a beat. We have the newspaper, and now we have the postcard from Charlie, now living in a distant city, starting anew. Right? The message is cryptic, but carries a tone of gratitude and hope. Jack realizes the personal cost, those around him. So it's all, and also the subplots influence, uh, you know, Mr. Jack. All right. Okay. So the main plot has Jack there with Elizabeth while she sings. Tom is still there. Uh, right. But the other two subplots are sort of given as like secondary moments. All right. Okay. Let's see. Now, uh, when you're practicing how to do this, because maybe you don't understand how to do it, it's complicated, which happens. You know, we, we're never great bicycle riders until we are great bicycle riders. We got to put time into it, just like writing. So start with a simple subplot or character arc in your current writing project or make up one from scratch. You can practice outside of writing. You don't, right? What do we always say here? Don't, pra pra don't practice only, uh, <laughs> practice only when you write. You don't have to practice when you write you can practice outside of your writing sessions and just focus on the skill itself um, but ultimately you want to sketch out the basic concept then try integrating integrating it into your uh, main plot using the 27 plot point outline as a guide focus on how this subplot or character's journey can add new dimensions not only to your story but to that plot point itself all right and of course always share your ideas final thought uh, so <laughs> as we close the chapter on today's lesson, pun intended, our subplots and character arcs are essential. All right. And you need to recognize the intricate dance of elements that make a story truly unforgettable. 
Subplots and character arcs are the veins through which the lifeblood of your narrative flows, enriching the main storyline with depth, complexity, and a tapestry of human experience. Crafting these elements with care is not just about adding layers to your story. It's about breathing life into your world, giving voice to the silent whispers of your character's desires, fears, and triumphs. The journey of inter intertwining uh, subplots and evolving character arcs is akin to weaving a delicate yet resilient web <laughs> where each thread contributes to the rank to the strength and beauty of the whole. It's a testament to the power of storytelling where the sum of the parts create a mosaic of human emotion and experience that resonates deeply with your readers. Now, as you embark on this journey, remember that each subplot you weave and each character arc you sculpt is a stroke of your brush on the vast canvas of your saga. Let this lesson be a beacon boop, 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 as you navigate the complexities of your narrative, guiding you to create a world where every subplot enriches the main story and every character's journey speaks to the heart of the human experience. So embrace the challenge for it is in the crafting of these intricate layers that your story finds its true depth and resonance. So as we part ways today, carry forward the insight and inspiration from today's exploration and let it fuel your creative journey. Remember, the stories you weave are not just tales to be told. They are lives to be lived, lessons to be learned, and worlds to be discovered. So as you continue to weave your narrative tapestry, so do with courage of a pioneer and the heart of a poet. The same. Real quick. I'd like to also add. Uh, have fun. Outlining a book series or saga part three. Oh, yeah, three. Expanding the story over. Okay, so what we're going to do in that, that video, the next video in the series, we're going to take what we saw today with the subplots and main plot, and we're going to actually break it up. How we break it up? Well, you'll have to watch the video to see. And we're going to show you how to take one long narrative and actually expand it into a series or a saga. Uh, and you could do that. So it's really nice to have a coherent beginning, middle, and end now, because you know what the long form version of that narrative would look like, even though it looks like one complete story. And then, well, Tom, what do we do after we expand it? Well, now we get to create more micro stories within that greater world. So that should be exciting. Question, what subplot or character arc have you found most compelling in your favorite series and why? Let me know in the comments below. And if you haven't done so already and you're like, you know, I really should. This stuff is great. I love his beards. <laughs> Please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. A uh, quick reminder, I am going to try to get back into doing live videos on Saturdays. You will see the scheduled live videos uh under uh the videos so if you go to live videos you'll see what is scheduled and uh what i usually do is uh i might do outlining in real time just so you can see the process where i explain what i am doing and why i'm doing it uh it's all on the cuff right off the cuff uh i'll go over other things that i have done videos on i will do those things in my videos i will show you uh, the writing process in real time. So it's just fun. And everyone gets to interact. You can ask questions. It's good times, good times. With that said, as always, keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Love you, bye.